demonstrates our market-based strategy with the goal of moving more good food to more people. The NGFN is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there's abundant uh, supply to meet the high demand, collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and, ins and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to create increased support for regional healthy food. So let me tell you about some of our current projects designed to meet those goals. A regional food hub is a business or organization that actively manages the, the aggregation, distribution, and marketing of source-identified food products, primarily from local and regional producers, for the purpose of strengthening producer capacity and access to wholesale, retail, and institutional markets. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration has been studying hubs and has recently come out with a Food Hub Resource Guide published by collaboration member USDA AMS. The collaboration has established a growing community of practice where hub managers and supporters can share knowledge and best practices to accelerate this work. We will be providing technical assistance as well as communicating successes, positive impacts, and good models. The Field Guide to the New American Food Shed is a web-based tool along with a comprehensive outreach program intended to teach producers and those who might offer them credit about the wide range of business possibilities available in this new food marketplace. Learn more about this project by uh, watching the archived November 2011 NGFN webinar and there will be some reference to it today. Um, the NGFN has teamed up with Farm Credit uh, to evaluate and improve educational instruments for financial training for growers. With an emphasis on working with the southern U.S. states, this program will create a toolkit of resources for those who train farmers on financial skills and business literacy. We've established a community of practice of these trainers, and working with them, we will ensure that all of the critical financial skills are effectively passed on to their students. This project also includes identifying gaps and creating content to fill those gaps. The NGFN works with uh, partners critical to the success and impact of the NGFN, including Marty Granzer at Morse Marketing Connections, USDA Agricultural Marketing Service, Wellspring Management, Origins, and Farm Credit Council, as represented today. Together with our national partners and regional partners, we are working on several projects in service of these goals. This map gives you a sense that we truly are a national network, and you should feel free to contact us any time. Email us at contact at ngfn.org, and here are a few other uh, web and email addresses you should note. So enough for me. Let me introduce today's presenters. Gary Madison works for the Farm Credit Council in Washington, D.C., which is a trade organization of the Farm Credit System. Farm Credit is a nationwide network of borrower-owned lending institutions providing credit for the nation's farmers and ranchers. As the Vice President for Young Beginning Small Farmer Programs and Outreach, Gary seeks to identify and meet the needs of the next generation of farmers and ranchers as part of Farm Credit's enduring mission of service to agriculture and rural America. Until recently, Gary was a small farmer operating a wholesale greenhouse business in New Hampshire, including raising cattle for the local freezer beef market. He holds bachelor's degrees in agronomy and biology from the University of Connecticut. And Aaron Pirro is a farm business consultant and assistant vice president for Farm Credit East, the Northeast's leading financial services cooperative for agriculture. Her work is centered on helping customers analyze their businesses from many angles in order to pinpoint methods for improving their profitability. In addition, Pirro leads First Pioneer's agricultural retail Benchmark, which is a comprehensive program of data analysis and benchmark reporting, as well as a customized seminar and consulting meeting for owners of farm markets, garden centers, nurseries, wineries, and other ag retail businesses. Erin received her undergraduate degree in resource economics and her master's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Connecticut. She was one of the four young farmers nationwide to be selected as a 2010 McCloy Fellow in Agriculture. Erin and her husband, Jonathan, make their home in Granby. Their family raises uh, and markets Connecticut-grown lamb and provides shearing services in southern New England. So Gary, Erin, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Um, this is Gary. Um, I wanted to, to start out by saying that, that this uh, project is funded by the Farm Credit Council and Farm Credit East as an add-on to a risk management education grant that uh, both of our organizations were involved in that was related to farm business planning. And as we got involved in that project, we saw the need to 
dig a little deeper into some of the unique business models that are available to local food system producers. And we picked um, getting engaged with CSA um, as a benchmarking exercise as our first project in that. So the, the, uh, the first question here is, is what, what is a benchmark? Um, and it is, a, uh, I, I'd say, one of the first things to understand about it is that benchmarking is not just about numbers. It requires a comparison of both performance metrics that are in numbers and business processes that are in words so that you can get the full story. What we think that benchmarking allows you to do is to identify problem areas or potential improvements in your business that you didn't know about. A good example of this was on my family farm where when we started, my dad pulled a price of $5 a pound for Connecticut grown lamb out of the air thinking that sounds fabulous, we'll make all kinds of money. But when we looked back at our own history, did some analysis, and compared it to how much money we thought we were making, we saw that not only were we not that far above other local lamb suppliers, or Omaha beef for that matter, we weren't making very much money at all. In fact, we were lucky to break even. So if we were to do this analysis and never do anything with it, we wouldn't still be in business. But because we had a standard against which to compare ourselves, we were able to make an improvement. And that improvement was tied in with the goal of figuring out, OK, how's my dad going to handle paying for health insurance when he retires? So that gave us not only a goal, but a way that we needed to improve our business to a known metric. We don't just say we need to earn more. As far as what goes into a benchmark, um, good records are absolutely essential to get the most out of it. The better your records, the more you're going to get out of it. And as I said before, these, these records are more than just numbers. If you think about it, a business plan is a kind of generalized benchmark containing lots of goals against which you measure your business performance. Um, as Aaron just said, they had a specific goal for earning a specific amount of money, enough to pay for the health insurance. You could say, I want to I want to net thirty thousand dollars this year um, in your business plan. That's a that's a viable goal for a benchmark. But to be able to really analyze how you're going to get to that benchmark, you need a, a whole bunch of other information. Uh, what good records allow you to do is to turn a general recipe for success, like your business plan, into specific management actions so that you can put your hands on the, on the levers of control of your business and actually make things turn out the way you want instead of having a very generalized goal and operating on hope for most of the year and only figuring it out at the end of the year whether you've actually accomplished the goal or not. Now there are many types of benchmarks and I bet you're familiar with some of these from your own life. You just don't know them by the name benchmark. Think about a historical comparison we all use when we go off to college. Right? In the fall, we wear one size clothes and they fit pretty comfortably. But when we come home for Thanksgiving, they don't fit so well. And it could be for a number of reasons. Maybe you are enjoying the social life, but now your clothes are a little bit tight. Or maybe your classes are clear across campus and the bus doesn't run on the schedule that you need it to, so you've been walking the entire time. Either way, you have a historical comparison of what you used to weigh compared to what you weigh now. Business standards are typical benchmarks. Anytime you go to a business school, they're going to give you a few of these, such as a 2 to 1 current ratio is a good target to aim for. You may compare to your peers on certain things. For instance, how many friends do I have on Facebook? How many points have I garnered on Foursquare this week? You may have goals, as Gary just talked about. Maybe you're trying to get your running time down to an eight-minute mile. You may also work on competition in the market. As I said before, when we were charging $5 a pound for beef in Omaha, or when we were charging $5 a pound for lamb in Omaha, beef was at $4 a pound. Wow, ours didn't seem so special, just by virtue of the fact that the average commodity price was right in the same ballpark. Now, there's a few things that go into a benchmark. They're simple, but they're very important. First of all, we need standardized data. For instance, it needs to be the same time period. For instance, the calendar year 2011. You need to have progressive business owners that are willing to essentially wake up in the morning and look in the mirror with no makeup on. 
they want to do better, so they're willing to roll up their sleeves, dig into the numbers, and see what kind of progress can be made based on what the numbers are telling us so far. Obviously, everybody's data is kept confidential because it's not really important exactly how much money Gary's farm makes compared to mine, but what we're trying to get at is a set standard against which we can compare ourselves. Because no one person is perfect, no one farm is perfect at everything. We want to see what's possible out there in the industry, and by collaborating, we all can do better. So what you're expecting to get out of a benchmark, of course, is something useful. And it's best to think in terms of, it's useful to me. It's, I mean, it's useful to you, of course. If the benchmark is some, I don't know, some kind of complicated financial ratio that you don't really understand, it's not useful. So don't use it. Benchmarks are something that you grow into. Uh, you don't have to start at the point where you are keeping detailed records of every, every single little thing that you do in your operation. Um, that's great if you can do it. But if you don't understand the output, if you don't understand the utility of, those, of why you're keeping all those records, you're going to stop doing it because there's, there's no reward in it. So don't be afraid as, as, as we get deeper into this presentation, you see some of the benchmarks. If some of them don't make sense, that's OK. Um, look at those benchmark metrics uh, that we'll be presenting in, in just a few more minutes and look at the ones that you think make sense and try to understand your operation in terms of what you can see that, uh, that you already have a concept about, whether it's um, how efficient you are in using your labor, how much you spend on, on fuel for the tractor, whatever it is, um, look at what makes sense to you first, because that's how you're going to be able to develop a focus in how useful benchmarking is for you. As far as what can be tracked, um, the list is endless. Uh, it just goes on and on. Um, but it does require deliberate thought about record keeping. Um, you have to be able to record detail that's appropriate in the records that you keep. Uh, for example, if you want to understand labor costs, you have to record um, the labor that's used on the farm. Most people would go right to their, if you're using Quicken, for instance, you go right to your payroll and you say, well, that's the cost of my labor. I've got hours and the cost and all that. Well, if you have volunteer labor, um, you know, if, you're, if you're, uh, your friends come over and help you put new greenhouse plastic on or something like that, you have to record that as volunteer hours expended to really understand the amount of labor that it takes to make your operation work. Because if, you, if you're sort of cheating on what you're recording, uh, you're leaving out the volunteer labor or you're, uh, you know, when customers come by and they decide they want to do a little bit of weeding in the tomato patch, and you don't really pay attention to that, even though they may stay for three or four hours and do a heck of a lot of work. You're cheating yourself on, in terms of recording accurately what your actual labor costs are. Another example may be... Um, uh, fuel use. If you if you have one line in your current accounting system that incorporates all your fuel use, whether it's uh, diesel fuel in the tractor or uh, heating fuel for the greenhouse or uh, transportation fuel for for the van that carries your labor force from your home farm to the farm that's ten miles away, uh, that's the kind of thing that you probably want to think about sorting that out and, and separating those different fuel uses so that you can have a sense of your efficiency in terms of transporting your labor, for instance. Uh, maybe that's something that you should be looking at more carefully to understand the full cost of moving your labor around as opposed to lumping it all in together. Exactly, Gary. And you'll notice that this list is obviously a few that we've pulled out that we encourage our folks to look at. And there are two that are bolded. If you're not familiar with these terms, you definitely should be. For instance, net worth, also known as owner equity, is, I like to tell people, that scorecard in the game of life where we say he who dies with the most toys wins. That shows that you're making financial progress from year to year. Because if your net worth is diminishing, it means you're losing money at whatever you're doing. And that is definitely not sustainable. Your net margin, or your profit, is the other one that you need to pay attention to. Because even if you're not in business to make money, 
which is a very odd thing for people to be in business for, you are going to need to replace equipment, you are going to need to pay back any loan payments, and you are going to need to provide for your family. That requires profit. And it's really not sustainable if you are only depending on what your farm can produce. Because my husband works for the power company, and as we know very well, they don't accept payment in vegetables. A real good example of the farms that I run into is when we find employees that are making more money than the owners. That makes absolutely no sense, especially since the owner is the one taking all of the risk related to the farm. So if you're really working on a sustainable enterprise, we need to think of what that word means beyond the environmental. It does mean financially, so that you're going to have a bright future here to be able to provide for the people that are counting on you for good food. One of the things we talk about is how are we using our resources most efficiently? And it's not just the soil amendments, it's not just the fuel, but it's all of the financial investments that we've made in the farm. When I ask a group of farmers what's your biggest expense, they often say labor. Well, what should your biggest expense be? If you're a people-related business, labor ought to be your biggest expense. But on the flip side, when things are running tight, everyone says, I should cut labor first. Well, if you're a people-related business, that may not be the best example. What if the problem is shrink instead? Anything that you're doing that you're not getting paid for, which could be harvesting a whole lot of produce that doesn't make it on the truck in time so that you can distribute it to your shareholders. Or perhaps it's a timing issue, whereas you have all of your labor clock in at your farm and then drive to a field that's 15 minutes away. For every four people, that's a wasted hour in the morning and a wasted hour in the afternoon that you're paying for. It could also be an issue with crop turns. Perhaps you're not planting again as quickly as you could be. Or perhaps you don't have your labor allocated correctly, meaning there are a lot of people standing around doing nothing, or there are too many people in the way where they're tripping over each other. Those are really simple, simple examples, but we often find bottlenecks in our own operations when we step back and look at them with brand new eyes. So as, uh, as a, just a general description, uh, in, in case we have some on the webinar that aren't familiar with what a, a CSA is as a, as a model, as a business model, um, uh, just read through this, this slide, uh, the general description, um, selling shares ahead of time. Uh, often the those who are buying shares, the customers, are assuming some of the production risk. In other words, if, if you don't produce anything as a CSA farmer, uh, you're not obligated to supply those customers necessarily with something if your crop fails. Now, this is this is the typical explanation of a CSA farm. Uh, typically, it's vegetable oriented, but uh, many CSA farms will add on something like flowers or, or meat or eggs um, or other specialties that may actually be from other farms or, or may be something that they add as an enterprise on their farm and then add to the CSA as a separate uh, fee for that. What's important to recognize is that these benchmarks that, that we'll be presenting to you aren't just um, they're probably expandable beyond just a CSA farm, uh, and because and I'm I'm saying that and providing a little wiggle room for us here because there are very very few farms that are a strict, absolutely uh, organized CSA farm. Many times there are other enterprises. You may have a farm stand. You may sell some material wholesale, and that's to some degree that's going to affect um, the the bank benchmarking numbers because you're going to be allocating effort to different ways of marketing and getting different returns from those markets. Um, but in general, the CSA model really lends itself to record keeping because as a CSA farmer, you're getting money up front in those annual subscription fees or membership free fees from your customers. And you generally have to have a budget on how you're going to spend that. So. Um, you know, I, I'm maybe maybe Aaron will will argue with me about this, but CSA farmers, in my mind, tend to be better record keepers right from the outset because they are forced into planning ahead because they've got a they get a big pile of money um, up front at the beginning of each year and they have to plan for how to use that money over time. 
uh, to make sure that they're producing a crop. One of the first things that we have folks do as they start to examine their financial records is to, su to sort the expenses that they have into two categories. One is variable and one is fixed. Think about the variable expenses as those that you incur more of as your production increases. If you're going to grow more vegetables, you're going to need more seeds. You're going to need more plants. You're probably going to need more soil amendments. You're probably going to need more labor at the same time. The fixed expenses, though, are ones that you're going to incur no matter how many days you're open, no matter how many acres you plant. Right? You're still going to be paying property taxes on your land. You're still going to be paying rent if you don't own the land. It doesn't matter how much production you incur. And the reason it's important to separate these two is because that focus then tells you what's the next step to take to improve your business. We're going to see a little bit more in a few minutes, but there's a big difference in businesses that make sure that they put better before bigger. If you have some issues with your operation and you try to expand it, those issues don't just double in size when your business doubles. They can often quadruple. So we want to make sure things are well run before we put any more onto our plate. That's always a lot to juggle. Once we've done this, we're able to sort these expenses into what we call a five-line income statement. I try to focus people on the things that they need to pay attention to rather than paying attention to all the numbers that may be on the page. Take insurance, for example. Barring a catastrophe where your premium is going to change, once you've paid that insurance bill for the year, it really isn't going to change. So there's no point in agonizing over that cost. There's no point in looking at it month after month after month because it isn't changing. You need to focus on the things that are going to make a difference in your business. So in creating the five-line income statement, we draw you to look at gross sales, your cost of production, also known as cost of goods sold. Subtracting that from gross sales gives you something called a gross margin, which is an indicator of how efficiently you're turning your raw materials into sales dollars. Then we subtract our overhead costs, and whatever is left over is called the net margin. That's essentially a farmer's paycheck, anything that they get to take home. But the challenge with being a sole proprietor is that that paycheck not only has to cover your living expenses, it also has to cover taxes. It also has to cover new investment in the business, like buying a new piece of equipment. And it also has to cover any loan payments. So if we don't start with that number to make sure it's adequate, the business is definitely not going to be sustainable. Okay, for those of you who are fans of National Good Food Network webinars, this next slide that's up here may look familiar because it's from the one-page business plan uh, that we've talked about in, in other webinars, in another webinar. And I just wanted to point out that if that slide that Aaron just showed about the five-line income statement was confusing, uh, there's another version of it with a whole long explanation that goes with it on foodshedguide.com. Dot org. I'm sorry, that should be foodshedguide.org, not .com on the bottom there in red. Um, that's the uh, New America, uh, Guide to the New American Food Shed website, and there's an explanation of this five-line income statement uh, that's much more extensive than what we're seeing on this slide and a little bit more information to help you put it in perspective. Um, if numbers are hard for you, uh, don't don't get too frustrated because there are people out there that you can find to help you uh, explain those numbers and deal with those numbers for you. Um, whether it's uh, hiring a, a CPA or your brother-in-law or whatever it is, you don't have to be expert at everything. You just have to understand the story that the numbers are telling you. And then you need to be able to decide what to do about them. The traditional model of financial record keeping is modeled on the IRS requirements. Right? Tax man needs you to keep records, so that's why most people keep it. But it's such a valuable tool that can make such a difference in your business, you might as well make them work for you. Here's what we're used to looking at, right? Income on one line, expenses on another, whatever is left over is profit. And in this case, there isn't a profit. In fact, it's a loss. 
And if you kept seeing that year after year, not only would you want to, but all of your advisors would tell you, you might as well hang it up. But if you apply some management analysis and do what we described a few slides ago, by separating your expenses into the variable ones that are related to production and the fixed ones or the overhead that are related to the asset base that you maintain, you're going to see a few things in this business. For instance, the cost of goods sold, also known as the cost of production here, is only 55% of sales, where the typical benchmark farm may be closer to 60. That means this business is actually more efficient at production or better at selling than their peers. That means that's something they should probably do more of. The overhead, however, is taking up a much greater percentage of sales than the benchmark says in this example, which means they have a huge investment in this farm compared to their peers. In order to bring those numbers into line, the solution here would be to grow the business because they are good at what they do. They are very efficient. So if we extend that to the next year and we look at the business having doubled, our cost of goods are still right in line. Notice that they increased. They were 55% of sales, and now they're 56% of sales. And you can lose efficiency by growing, meaning by getting bigger. So be sure you watch that. But the overhead here, the same dollar amount, is now only 30% of sales, which is much closer to the benchmark line. And look at that profit. It's now 15% of sales compared to what we're saying at the benchmark at 14%. So the right answer here was for this farm to grow because they were very good at what they do. And Aaron, if you if, just staying on that slide for a moment, Aaron, the uh, uh, it's we're not we're not trying to sell the idea that if you get bigger, you solve all your problems. Um, there's just as likely to be a, a farm, a CSA farm that had nearly the opposite. Uh, sort of uh, sort of financial pattern where the solution would have been that they had uh, they could afford to shrink their operation and make more money as if uh, for instance uh, if their overhead costs were already very low um, by by cutting uh, labor for instance and deciding to to only farm half as much ground they might actually become more profitable. So uh, don't think we're, that just because our example was one that, that showed growth, don't think that, that growth is the, uh, is the answer for all solutions, or the answer for all situations. Right, and even with this business example, remember I pointed out how the cost of goods increased relative to sales? That's something you need to watch out for with growth. So this is applied on a case-by-case -case basis, but you need to have the numbers telling you the story, not just have them all lumped together like we typically do for tax accounting. If you're okay, interested, so here's, you're, oh, I, I was just going to say, so drum roll. I mean, here's the drum roll, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are these are the act. This is the slide that you want to print out and and post over your computer screen if you're a CSA farmer so that you've got an idea of what other people are doing. And, and just note that there's, it's divided in half here. Uh, these, these benchmarks are listed as both a percent of sales or as a per acre measure. Um, and as, you, as Aaron talks about it further and as you look at these comparing to your operations, I think you'll see why sometimes it's more advantageous. It, it tells you a better story to compare this to a percent of all of your sales versus a per acre price. Okay, sorry about that, Erin. I just had to get in the drum roll. <laughs> no problem. You'll notice net profit is one of the first ones because it is the most important. In any room full of farmers that I walk into, they can all tell me how much money they made last year, but very few can tell me how much money they kept last year. We work our way here in the reverse of an income statement, just so you can get your head around what we're saying on that regard. The first few lines are overhead. Right? Interest is something the bank expects to be paid, no matter how much business you do. The landlord expects their rent payment. And that's for total rent, though I've broken it down on a per acre basis. If there are barns or sheds included, that is included in the rent figure. Repairs are an overhead expense, as is insurance. We look at our gross margin, which is what's left over after our cost of production. That's a really good indicator for folks to look at and see how efficient they are. You'll notice the other pieces that are pointed into the cost of goods sold area. 
but you'll see that labor is called a hybrid. For this reason, because we all tend to hire people that do different functions on the farm, but we tend to have one line for payroll in our records. This is a really good example of what Gary was talking about before with the fuel. If you have a hired manager or you have a hired bookkeeper, those people really are considered overhead because their job is required no matter how much business you do. Whereas your production labor or your delivery and distribution labor is really related to the costs of selling. So that would be a variable expense. So make sure you pay attention to these and have them allocated in the right area. But to give you an idea of where the hired labor budget is, that's where this number is coming from. So if you, uh, I don't think you should get worried that you need to do all of this at once. Um, I, if, you, if you pick three of the, um, of the items to prioritize after doing a uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats sort of analysis, um, you'll have a better chance of actually accomplishing something. Part of the, part of the problem of, of uh, hiring a consultant or being on a webinar like this or going to a session at a, a workshop session at a conference is you get all sorts of good ideas and you get overwhelmed. Um, what we're really suggesting to you is that you, you, uh, you pick a few areas and prioritize to get used to the idea of doing one thing at a time and doing it well um, and doing the things that you are, uh, you're going to be able to aim at making more money next year. Um, making money isn't, isn't your end goal necessarily. I mean, that, that's, uh, money is a wonderful thing. In the end, what you want to do is have, be able to have choices in your life to be able to sustain the lifestyle you want. Um, for the most part, that ends up being having the money to be able to make the choices you want. But what we're, what we're really trying to say is um, if you don't know what to do with the numbers, ask for some advice. Uh, don't turn into an ostrich. Stick your head in the sand and, and ignore what's going on. So now we're going to take an example. What if the labor costs in our business are high at 45% of our sales instead of the 33 to 35% the benchmark tells us is a good target? What do we do next? Well, let's look at that in a few different ways because this number right here indicates to most people, the dairy farmer and all of us, that we need to cut costs. That's something that we all have inherent in us. But it could be that maybe we're not selling enough for the amount of labor that we've got hired. These things work more than one way. So let's dig into the analysis a little bit further. If we were to look at our cost per worker equivalent to see if we're paying our people too much, what does the benchmark tell us? If we look at a full-time equivalent, and for those of you not familiar with the term, that just is a way of evening out the effects of part-time employees and seasonal employees compared with any full-time employees you may have. So you add up all of your hours, of payroll and volunteer and owner labor, if you're considering that you're getting paid too, and divide it by the total of your payroll plus what the owner takes out. That's a per hour basis. But if you're going to look at a full-time equivalent, we want those total hours and we want to divide that by 2040, which is how much the average full-time equivalent works in one year. That way we can compare a business to another business on the same basis. So if we spend $30,000 on a full-time equivalent and the benchmark is $30,500, that means we're spending an average amount per worker. So we're not paying our people too much. How about hours worked per acre? If we were to look at that and our records told us that we spent 345 labor hours per acre and the benchmark was 350, we're actually a little more efficient with our labor. So what's going on here? Then I would suggest let's look at sales per worker equivalent. Well, what if for every worker we have, the full-time equivalent, we're garnering $50,000 of income and the benchmark farms, meaning our peers, are able to earn $75,000 of income? The conclusion here is that we're not selling enough stuff. Maybe it's we're selling less produce or less meat or whatever our product happens to be. 
But it could also be that our prices are too low, so we're just not getting the same dollars compared to the rest of our industry. So that gives us a plan. We need to boost our sales efficiency. It's not that we need less labor, per se. It's not that we need to really work on our efficiency, although we certainly could improve each of those. We're going to get the biggest bang for our buck working on the one where we can see the most improvement. And we know it's possible if the other benchmark farms are able to do it. So what are some of the strategies? Here's where we brainstorm and say we could increase prices. Maybe we could add value, such as adding another delivery site and charging for that delivery. Maybe we even make it home delivery. Maybe we change our product mix so our customers are willing to pay more for it. Maybe we just need to do some sales training with our staff, have them get out, talk to more people so that we'll be able to sell more product. That's what's important to involve the management team in and the employees. Once you have the strategy for where you want to go, then you figure out how to make a plan and how to execute that plan. You also want to make sure that once you have this plan in place, you track the changes you see in your organization. Because nothing is perfectly implemented the first time through. So you need to make sure that you're looking at how your labor is growing compared to your sales growing. Or, on the flip side, how is the sales efficiency improving with the same amount of people? The bottom line is what gets measured gets managed. So you need to pay attention to these things and how is the execution being handled. Um, we can't hear you. I just I just said some really insightful stuff and I forgot what it was. Gosh, I knew no. it. I okay, knew it. I, <laughs> I remember. Um, if if you're uh, if you're hanging around with farmers that are really engaged in their business, they're they're active, they're they enjoy what they do. They're going to want to share good ideas. That's that's what we talk about as farmers. Um, I'd contrast that with with hanging around with people who like to complain about where they are in life and what how bad their farm is doing you're probably not going to get so much good information from somebody who likes to complain as opposed to somebody who likes to try to improve. So uh, there's, there's strategies out there that other people will use that you can learn from. And I think in general, people will share those strategies. But you have to be the right kind of person to be able to enter into conversations that are going to encourage people to share good strategies. One of my favorite examples about some of these top performers in the industry is a couple of produce farmers near Worcester, Massachusetts, who put out strawberries and had a little contest to see who could sell their strawberries for more. And the two are such characters, their customers absolutely loved it and were perfectly willing to pay $4 a pint for strawberries at the beginning. And then the guy over the hill said, oh yeah, I can get four and a half, watch me. And then the first guy, not to be outdone, said five. And before you know it, they were selling strawberries for $6 a pint five or six years ago. And it was because they were looking at what the bottom lines were on their farm. They were looking at what else the market would value, because it doesn't help them to leave the money on the table. And their customers are happy, too, because they know their farmer, they know who these characters are, and they love them for it. These guys also manage their costs more carefully, because they are paying attention to the numbers and they make sure the customers have a great experience while they're doing it. And I've watched them for the past five years as part of one of our benchmark programs increase their net worth 10%, which is pretty hard to do the bigger the number they get. So we're seeing actual results from people that are paying attention to the numbers, making sure that they're headed in the right direction, and they're achieving the goals that they set for their operation. I think one of the most important things of, of pieces of advice here that, that you're, you're getting from this webinar, hopefully, is to have confidence. Um, you're going to be able to look at your numbers, hopefully, and your operation in terms of benchmarking, even if it's only against benchmarking against uh, your last year's numbers. Uh, consider that a benchmark, or against some of the more generalized benchmarks that are on one of the previous slides. Um, but you need to have confidence that, uh, that you're going to be able to accurately record 
the uh, the numbers that make up the data that you're going to be using in your uh, benchmarks. And the, probably the most important thing is to not forget why you're doing this. If you can manage from your budget, if you get into the habit of looking at your budget on, a, on at least a monthly basis, then you're actually using that budget as a tool and it's becoming, going to become increasingly valuable to you. It's not going to be a burden. It's not going to be, oh, that, that number stuff. I hate to do that number stuff. If you look at it enough and understand where those numbers are coming from, it's going to be a tool just like your shovel or your hoe or your rototiller. It's going to be something that you're going to get. Where did I leave that thing? You know, where, where do I, uh, I, I need to look at my budget so I know how I'm doing because that's going to be what builds your confidence in being able to take an action as far as management and then see the results, you know, get a feedback loop, if you will. The numbers that you're keeping shouldn't be just for the IRS man, like Aaron said. They should be, the, the numbers that you keep should be for your management purposes first. Um, and again, if you're, if you are scratching your head saying, well, I'm not a numbers person, this doesn't make any difference to me, change your mind about that. Find someone that can help explain numbers to you because all numbers are, are words that are, that are stretched out in, in funny figures. Um, every pile of numbers that you've got from your, from your budget or from your business plan tells a story in words. If you're having trouble translating that, find someone to help you uh, because they're out there and very willing to help you and it, it may actually be uh, an, another farmer, your neighbor, an accountant, um, a, a business consultant that can help you translate what you're doing so that you can uh, be effective and efficient in the business that you're trying to operate. Now that's, uh, that's the end of our prepared slides and we're now at the time for questions. We've seen some questions come in, uh, but I'll turn it back to Jeff to moderate the, the question and answer session of this. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, there are a few questions about um, the sources of the numbers. Um, so can, can you explain um, the, the nature of how you, um, how you collected the data and um, which, which types of farms are uh, involved, et cetera? are a group of actual farms in uh, the northeastern United States who are looking for better comparison numbers than are about there available right now. Uh, so they came to us. They are looking for some standards within the industry and uh, wanted to, pro again, they're the progressive folks that are looking to better their businesses. Uh, so we collected accrual financial information for 2011, and uh, these are folks that have CSAs for sure. Um, minimum size of, uh, I believe it's 80 shares, and uh, uh, go on from there. Great. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I'm uh, posting a few SWOT uh, resources, but um, can you just give just a, a two-minute explanation of how one would go through uh, a, a SWOT analysis of a of form? Sure. The words first are strengths, opportunities, excuse me, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So you can do this on your own. You can have a brainstorming session with a coworker. You can even get together with a bunch of your peers and sit down and talk about what are the strengths in your operation? What are the things that you do really, really well? Then think about the weaknesses. And again, that's some of the harder things for us to pick out because we have to admit what we could do better with. But if you can't address the issue, there's half of your problem right there. Then we go on to opportunities. What are new things that we could be doing on our farm? What are ideas that came up last year that we just never got to because we ran out of time or didn't have the amount of money that we needed? And then threats. What are the things that could put us out of business? And once you've got that list together, ask yourself, what are the three things I could do to make more money in the next year? And use that as a brainstorm to prioritize them. If the biggest threat is that the land you rent is going to be sold for houses, which unfortunately happens all too often in this area of the country, 
you need to secure some land. So do you have a long-term lease drawn up? Do you try to purchase the land for yourself? Maybe you need to take on a partner in order to be able to make that happen. But because you've identified that as a threat to your business, you can do something about it now. You can develop a plan. You can engage any of those opportunities that have come up. Or maybe you're building on strengths that you already have. So it's just a question of addressing these ideas and then prioritizing them, picking three at a time so you don't overwhelm yourself. Put them up on a chalkboard, put them up on a whiteboard, wherever you want to keep them, even on a giant piece of paper in the barn. And when you accomplish one, cross it out and pick another one from the list. So they only have three that you're looking at at every time. But you're making progress. Great. That's, I think that's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> Blake is asking if there is a significant difference um, with um, when, when you analyze the data, if there's a significant difference with a five acre CSA farm versus a larger, say, 30 acre CSA farm. Um, the, you know, you, you did a percentage sales and you did uh, per acre, but when you when you look at the data, th does it does it sort of fit various sizes pretty well? Great question. And one of the things that we want to be careful of, as I said before, is make sure that we maintain confidentiality here. So as the study grows and more farms join on, we'll be able to break it down into different sizes by acreage, um, by size of the CSA, by varying distribution channels. Because as Gary said earlier, many of them have not just CSAs, but have a retail stand or perhaps also uh, do a lot of farmers markets. And then some wholesale to restaurants or other distributors for, with extra produce, or uh, that's the channel that they've developed from back in the day that they like to continue. Uh, the reason I haven't broken it down farther is sample size. We don't have enough in each division to be able to do that and maintain confidentiality yet. Um, but I am seeing, especially in the overhead, that changes. Because think about this as something that as you grow, you have to grow in chunks with your overhead. If you buy land, you're not necessarily going to be productive on all of that land in year one. So th as you grow, you actually decrease in some of your asset utilization. And then as you become more familiar with it, you get a little more efficient with it, you do end up uh, reaping some of those benefits, which positions you to make the next jump. Great. Um, uh, were all of the businesses uh, in the benchmark study profitable? The least profitable one actually broke even. Huh. Okay. And I consider uh, break even anywhere between 1% of sales, plus or minus, because mm -hmm. things can change, obviously, over time. And uh, don't know what your weather was like in 2011, but we had a few challenges up this way. Mm-hmm. This is this is a um, this is definitely you're you're guessing here. We're not working from the study, but um, in in what ways do you think um, the benchmark numbers, which by the way are are back up on your screen, how would you theorize they would change uh, as you go into different regions of the the U.S.? We have people on um, from all across the U.S., so. Um, it, you know, the, the, this is a study in the Northeast. Um, I guess how applicable and how would it change? Really good question. That is going to vary very much from region to region. And think about all the other agricultural crops where this would be a challenge. For instance, if you're growing uh, greenhouse plants in the Northeast, you have a fuel oil expense. Versus if you're growing them in Florida, you have maybe a cooling expense or that of shade cloth to make sure that those plants don't get fried. So that's some of the things that you need to take into account as you start to look at a benchmark across the country. Um, you're going to have different land rent or different ownership costs. Even the price of land is going to be very different from Connecticut to New York or from one part of New York to another, for that matter. Uh, you're going to see different costs of labor depending on where you are. So those things all do need to be taken into account. And if you can find a benchmark near you, somebody that wants to start one, uh, I know Gary can talk a little bit more about efforts going forward on moving this across the nation so that there are better resources with more specifics to the different region. Uh, I think that's something that definitely has a bright future. 
Uh, but in your own backyard, if you want to just compare numbers with your neighbor, that's a great place to start. You know, kind of an I'll show you mine if you'll show me yours. That's the price of admission. But if you're willing to be open and honest about what the numbers are, that's a fabulous place for you to start. Mm -hmm. And I would say, uh, Jeff, I'd add, add to that by saying that um, in any benchmark uh, that you see like this, if you're running a, a typical CSA operation, um, this, these are presented in a range uh, as a percent of sales, for instance. Um, they're, they're, that's the place where you start. Any benchmark you have, even if it's your previous year's production records and financial records, or if you're using that as, as your benchmark, um, understanding why it's different is just as important as having a benchmark that says, well, you should be here. Because in the end, um, how much, how you manage your business and what your goals are, are going to change your results. If you're less interested in, in net profit um, and in this particular year, uh, because you're making more of an investment in land, for instance, then you know you can explain that to yourself. Or if you've bought that new piece of equipment, uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't make your your benchmarking irrelevant. It makes it even more important to understand why you have a variance from any any benchmark. And as far as extending this across this, the country, um, one of the difficult things is is finding a sample size. Um, as as Aaron mentioned, that is statistically significant that that you can work with. Um, so there needs to be not only a, a concentration of CSA farms, but unfortunately, one of the most difficult things about finding a sample is a sample that has actually got good financial records that are that are good enough to compare. Uh, you know, the the uh, without casting aspersions on, on small farmers, you know, I was one for 30 years, sometimes we don't always keep the best records. And that's what's absolutely necessary for uh, an institution like Farm Credit East to collect that information together and turn it into uh, a set of benchmarks that actually has some, some performance backing behind it. Another thing to understand about Farm Credit is that Farm Credit is 83 different institutions around the country. Farm Credit East covers New England, New York, New Jersey, um, pretty much. Um, so they have they have a lot of CSAs in their territory. They've been lending to them for for decades. They understand that that business and they want to know more about it. Um, other parts of the country, each Farm Credit institution that's there has to uh, recognize that. CSAs are an important potential part of their business or an important part of their current business and say, not only do we need to understand this, we need to tell our customers about it. Um, and that's a, uh, you know, to be, to be frank about it, not every farm credit institution is at that point of, of wanting to do that. Part of the reason for the Farm Credit Council and Farm Credit East for putting this together is, is to show that it can be done and to show that it is useful for both the lender to be able to look at benchmarking information like this, uh, the, if if, a, if you're a lender in uh, uh, some part of the country and you've never seen a CSA farm before and you just read about it in Time magazine or something, that's your total background on what a CSA is. It would be extremely helpful to have this slide that's up in front of us now to be able to get a picture from a financial mind sort of perspective. Well, here's what it ought to look like. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're putting this together and why um, uh, this webinar will be available on the National Good Food Network and we will um, in the near future get this information onto the, to the foodshedguide.org website with some explanation so that it resides there and is accessible to all. I think the other thing to remember too is that you know, a benchmark is an average, a weighted average. And there are folks that are blowing away some of these categories. They are doing more sales per acre. But by the same token, there are folks that are doing quite a bit less. So giving yourself a standard middle of the road here is a great target to look at. But you also need to compare it to your own performance. So if you are already having your overhead under control, it's your cost of goods that you need to work on, your production input. right? Don't fall off the wagon and say, OK, I can offend to spend a whole lot more on my overhead. 
great. Keep up the line that you've already maintained. Make sure you keep doing a good job there, but concentrate on those efforts where the standards are showing that they're, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. There are a couple questions about <clears throat> Um, how, uh, if there are resources for understanding how to price out shares, <clears throat> you know, especially for the for the people just starting out uh, creating a CSA, there's there, there may not be a market for them to analyze by, by just looking at what their peers were are charging locally. Is there assistance of, of this sort? I mean, is that is that something, for instance, that that a, a local farm credit institution would be willing to assist with? Sure. I mean, that's the big part of my job is helping farmers ask the right questions and then figure out the answers for that. If you don't have your peers to go off of, and maybe that's not the best way always because we see a lot of farmers that try to be the low cost provider, and that doesn't necessarily drive you in the right direction. But a budget can be a great tool for this regard. And your accountant can help you with a budget, uh, maybe your farm credit loan officer or consultant for sure. Uh, anybody that's got some financial background that understands the numbers that can help you with budgeting. Because if you know what your whole farm picture is going to look for, and you make sure you're paying yourself in that budget, then you can figure out, all right, how much is this going to produce? And divide that by the number of shares and a dollar figure that you're looking at. And then you can make modifications. You know, if you see full shares in the $600 range, but you think that's a little uh, too pricey for your neighborhood, okay, well, how many more shares would I need to sell if it was 500 Or the flip side, you think folks are willing to pay more because they value the local produce and knowing their farmer and it's good food that you're producing, maybe you can increase the price and have to sell fewer shares. Um, a lot of it is asking the what-if questions and figuring out, can I live with the answer? And if not, trying a different alternative. Mm -hmm. um, so this, if, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Gary. Yeah. So if if you're a new farmer and you're and you're thinking to yourself, so all this is great, you know, I should find somebody to ask advice and all that, but I want to start now. Um, it's it's a uh, it's it maybe a little scary thing to do, but you can work backwards from the benchmarking. Uh, that's that's on this screen, and and I would point out that uh, Jeff sent you an email earlier in the day that should have copies of these slides as a PDF, so you can print these out. Um, but you can start from sales. Uh, if you have, if you are in a particular area, one of the one of the easier things to find out from producers or from cooperative extension as a source would would just be a, an idea of how much can I sell per acre? What are, what's a gross sales per acre uh, figure? And work backwards through this benchmark from there. It's, it's rough, it's crude, but if you're just starting out, um, that would give you an idea. And, and under, most important, it would give you a way to understand if I'm expecting to sell $20,000 per acre, then how do I get to a, uh, a per share price, for instance? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so it's a it's a, a process. There's there's no there's no answer. It's the the answer is the, is the process in a sense. <clears throat> um, Absolutely, because what's going to work for my farm isn't necessarily going to work for Gary's farm. And the answer that you come up with the first time may not be perfect. So the important thing is that you execute the plan, and then you assess it to see how well it worked, and then make adjustments as necessary. And if I if I didn't mention that a benchmark isn't a recipe, uh, let me say it again: that looking at this and expecting that you could go out in your backyard and, well, these guys from Farm Credit said I could do this. Um, it's, that's not how it works. This is a benchmark is not a recipe. It's it's an indication. It's a directional arrow. Uh, it's a set of standards. It takes your understanding of how you turn uh, your operation into something that you can. Uh, accurately and effectively monitor closely enough and write down those performance measures and your costs uh, and your inputs so that you can actually understand the management. Uh, in the end, benchmarking is not a recipe, it's a management tool. Um, 
there was a point of clarification that all of these were individual farm CSAs um, or not. In other words, you, you mentioned that some CSAs expand their box by um, using produce from neighboring farms or, or, or other products from neighboring farms. Was there, in the makeup of, of this study, were they all single farm? I'm not sure I follow the question. It seemed like it was in two parts, but they are individual farm operators. Uh, some are partnerships, some are sole proprietors. Uh, and do they utilize product from other farm to fill in some of their shares uh, or at their farm markets? Yes, for the most part they did. Um, as we are seeing folks that want to provide more value to their customers, they move away from the I have to grow everything mentality, which I find very interesting because some folks have soil that is better suited to particular crops than others do. So they may strike up a partnership with a neighbor that says, I'll grow these particular crops and I'll grow these, you'll grow these particular crops uh, and then we'll purchase from each other so that we can offer them within our own businesses. Or maybe the customers are asking for honey. That's a huge product around here, but with all the other inputs the farm needs, we just don't have time to grow the bees and make the honey. So we'll buy in honey uh, to add it to our shares. Um, Brad is asking, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and if, if you were to do that, if you were at, to buy in the honey, looking at the, the slide that's up on the screen, that goes into your uh, cost of goods sold. You're, you're buying it. So it's a, it's a direct cost. It's really easy to figure out if you're buying honey for for five dollars a unit and you're selling it for uh, for ten dollars a unit you know what your cost of goods sold is you know what your gross margin is um, well as long as we're talking about where to place things there are a couple questions um, if grant money uh, is considered just profit Ooh, depends on what the grant money is used for if it's mm -hmm. something that is used to build a barn or improve your fencing it's a capital improvement. So depending on what your tax person says, you may be paying tax on it, or you may be lowering your basis in whatever property you are acquiring with that grant. But it really doesn't have anything to do with the actual operation of your farm. It doesn't matter if you borrowed that money or if it was coming out of your savings. That's how that should operate. Uh, if it was a grant money that comes more along the lines of uh, disaster payments that you know, we're making up for a loss of crops, then yes, that would be considered in place of sales. Not the ideal way to do it. <laughs> okay. However, uh, and, <laughs> but it's, uh, and where where do you put owner labor? Is that do you put that as a hired labor? Oh, really good question. Ideally, your owner labor would be part of your overhead, right? Because you should expect to get paid no matter what. From a tax standpoint, if you are a sole proprietor, your owner labor is coming out of profit. But to truly make sure that your operation is financially sustainable, you should consider owner labor as part of the overhead. Because if you weren't there to take care of the management duties that you do right now, the farm needs to be able to hire somebody to perform those duties. And that's something that we often see on farms, particularly small farms, is that we don't value our own labor at the market cost. Why not? There's a lot of theories on that. But the danger is that you are creating a farm that cannot afford to replace you if you're not there, which means without you, the farm is not sustainable. There is no room for the next generation. There is no room for someone to pick up and run with it where you left off if you're not paying yourself what your real value is. Right. Good point. Um, there, um, Rhonda and Danny are asking um, for clarification on the line uh, that is the purchases for resale. What does what does that mean? That would be anything specifically bought from another farm to then resale. So Gary was talking about the honey a little bit ago. If you don't grow honey and you buy honey to resell it, that would be a purchase for resale. It's part of your total cost of goods, just like your crop inputs are, and if you grew honey, you would see all of the bee-related costs as crop inputs rather than something that you bought for resale. Got it. Okay. Um, are there 
Um, are there other data sets um, like this, or, or perhaps less analyzed, um, more raw, that people can dig into for small and, and medium-sized farms? So Bob I'm was talking about. Pretty scary on that one because I think everybody's definition of small <laughs> and medium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gen generally, no. Um, this is this is very difficult information to gather. Um, you, you know, think about the confidentiality involved. Um, also, think about the effort required to gather it. I, I know there are some programs going on now. Uh, uh, for instance, at Michigan State, Susan Coccarelli is is engaged not exactly in something like this, but trying to to gain better information uh, about benchmarking and about uh, uh, financial information for smaller operations. Um, it's a very valuable effort. The, the difference in, I guess you could say, well, why hasn't it been done? Um, where it may have been done, well, it has been done for large-scale agriculture. Um, there are more dollars involved there the, in, in terms of large-scale agriculture. Um, the management decisions are are not in terms of thousands of dollars, they're in terms of tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So everybody involved in that kind of larger scale operation really wants to know this information. Um, it's very predictable in some kinds of op operations, uh, for instance, row crops, where it is much less predictable, um, less repeatable in an operation like a CSA, uh, from farm to farm or from season to season. So. The nature of the information, that it's from many smaller farms, of which there are fewer overall, I have to point that out, this, the total sample size is going to be a lot smaller of CSAs in the United States than there are uh, dairy farms in the United States, for instance. So uh, you know, will it be done? I sure hope so. Uh, part of what we're trying to accomplish here is to show, is to demonstrate that this information is valuable. Uh, to uh, particularly to young beginning and small farmers, and that uh, we're trying to get out in front of it and 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 show that it's uh, it is able to be collected and it's worthwhile to be collected. I think one other point to make is that when you start a small business, it's because you generally love what you're doing. You don't necessarily have a business degree or business management skills that you want to put to the test. So your management capabilities grow as your business grows. And once you get to a certain size and you've got all the production pieces under control, then you tend to start to want to look at the numbers. Even though it's very important at any stage to look at the numbers, people would more often rather spend $10,000 on a tractor than they would sitting down with their accountant to review their numbers. That's just the reality of it. But if you were to spend even $500 on financial analysis at the very beginning, that could make you that money back 10 or 20 times over. But because it's not tangible, it's very hard for people to get behind spending that money in the first place. So say, consider all of your options right there. How much money is that tractor going to return you for the dollars invested compared to how much money some of this financial planning could return you for the dollars invested? Okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna pick one more one more question here. We're we're running out of time, um, but um, uh, how? Um, I, I, this is sort of a, a question following up on what you were just saying, Aaron. How um, how is a farmer to choose a, a good financial advisor? And at the beginning, we talked about uh, getting your, your brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law may need, not be the most fantastic um, <laughs> financial advisor. So is, is there some way to, um, you know, if, if you're starting out, you know, this, is, this is just the beginning. You don't have a history of, of trust with anyone. Um, how, how do you choose someone to trust? Really good question. I would start by asking people I admire who they work with, people that seem to be doing a really good job people that I define as successful, who they're working with, and see if I can get some leads that way. And then I would spend some time meeting them, interviewing them, because you want to be sure that you're comfortable with who they are. Especially if numbers are not your thing, you need to make sure that you have a comfort level with those 
folks and that you're able to ex understand what they're explaining in the terms that they're using. So it's kind of a two-way street that you're interviewing them at the same time they be, may be interviewing you as a prospective client. But if there are people you know and trust and admire who already work with these folks, that's a really good start. And I think that works for anything, right? I mean, you pick a doctor based on other people's experience that you're comfortable with, right? What kind of recommendations they come with, what their background is, they know your specifics uh, or your specific industry. Um, those are all important considerations at the same time. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Gary. Thank you, Erin. This was um, fabulous. And it's clear that uh, though this tool is incredibly useful in order to get a full use out of it, a producer must first uh, track certain key financial indices um, in her operation. And um, that's, that's always good advice. Um, I want to note that uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website along with nearly three dozen other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to s send this to others who you think would like to have heard the panel and take some professional development time yourself and dig through our excellent archives. You can visit ngfn.org slash webinars. This webinar should be up within a few business days. Our webinars are organized into topics. If you look in the left-hand navigation area, dig into whatever interests you. We offer NGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. That's noon 30 Pacific. Sign-up links are always at ngfn.org slash webinars. We are running a bonus morning uh, webinar in a couple of weeks on May 31st. Uh, this is at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. We're running it early because our prime intended audience is producers, and we want to get them before they go in the field uh, for the day. So no matter what type of farm or food enterprise you envision, uh, a business plan will serve well. So in this webinar, we go into depth uh, to, in the one-page business plan and one-page financial plan that Gary mentioned earlier in this webinar. So these tools will, will get you started um, and uh, maybe something that you could take to uh, a financial uh, assistant analyst um, to get so they can get to know you and you can get to know them. Uh, in June and July, we're fo focusing on grass-based animal agriculture. First, uh, we'll take a look at the strong market for grass-based beef, including a market anal analysis the Wallace Center has been doing for the past year, as well as a case study of a cooperative model we think with, can be replicated in many parts of the country. And then in July, we'll look at the market and other benefits of transitioning to grass-based dairy. Again, we'll have a case study and an introduction to an apprenticeship program designed to effectively get new and transitioning ranchers up to speed on the different intensive management techniques. I want to uh, mention three other Wallace Center websites. Foodhub.info is a food hub hub of information, research, case studies, a map of the many food hubs across the country, uh, which we are continually updating, even links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. If you are a TA provider or a consultant on this call, you should take some time and create your or update your profile on ngfn.org. This is becoming an established place for people in need of assistance to find help, so you want to be listed there. There are over 180 individuals and organizations already, and that number is growing. HughFed.org is our site for the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center run by the Wallace Center. This program and website is focused on increasing access to food to underserved communities using market-based solutions. On the site, you'll find a description of the initiative, grantee profiles and photos, and a library of some of the best food access resources. If you have a resource you'd like to share, let us know. You can email us at contact at ngfn.org or hughfed at winnock.org. And foodshedguide.org, this is what Gary mentioned a couple of times, is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive text and case studies with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on legal status, such as LLC or C Corp. And um, this webinar should also be posted there. And uh, when ready, the, the benchmark study as well. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name and interests and your bio to our, our database. Um, and again, this is all part of the NGFN acting as a connector. You can look for the database link in the resources section. And if you haven't already, please sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know on the post-webinar survey, and we'll sign you up. Please contact us at any time contact at ngfn.org. 
the NGFN would like to thank you again for your time today and let me encourage you to fill out the survey that will open your web browser in just a moment. This concludes the webinar. Thank you very much.